Hello, I'm Fred Langan. This is CBC News Business for Thursday, October 25th. Here are today's top stories. Under the new framework, Albertans will get their fair share. Royalty pain, Alberta's premier bites the bullet and raises royalties. And investing elsewhere, and Canada sinks 700 million into deep canoe. On a day when oil closed above $90 a barrel for the first time, Alberta hiked the royalties imposed on oil and gas companies. Premier Ed Stelmack made the announcement just over an hour ago despite warnings from Alberta's energy sector. Our Calgary business correspondent Dave Sims has been in the lockup learning about how this plan works and he joins us now. So what did the Premier announce today? Well, Fred, royalties are going up. Here's what the Premier had to say. Under the new framework, Albertans will get their fair share approximately $1.4 billion by 2010. Substantial increase of 20% over royalty projections under the current system. This is very close to what the controversial citizens panel had recommended. And just to show this to you again by graphic, uh, to make sure that you've got it right, uh, the, uh, it'll be a 20% increase to 1.4, or by $1.4 billion in the year 2010. And those changes take effect in 14 months. So how is this going to affect oil companies, the ones our viewers uh, invest in in the Alberta oil business? Well, the tax take is way up. I'll show you another board here, and that is showing the total tax take from the feds and the Alberta government, including royalties. In the oil sands area, it goes from the present 47% to a range of 56 to 66%. On conventional oil, from 44% up to 49% and in natural gas from 58% to 60%. So in other words, depending on your assumptions, everybody will pay more, but the oil sands will pay even more. Um, as, as well, there's a very important point for investors in Syncrude and Suncor. They have received special treatment uh, under uh, individual contracts that s treat them better than other competitors. Uh, the government has said that they have 90 days to renegotiate that, or in its words, the government will take other measures to ensure a level playing field. So quickly, what's next? What's next? Well, do we get an election? But certainly in the, uh, over, the, over this whole issue. But I think what we're also going to see is the, the companies will take a hit tomorrow because the assets on the ground are worth less than they were. Uh, costs have gone up. And uh, production may even fall. If uh, high production wells are too expensive in the royalty change, uh, it may have to be uh, slowed down. Oh, thanks very much, Dave. The Canadian oil and gas giant Ancana has said that the threat of an increase in royalties could lead it to invest more of its money outside Alberta. Today, it did just that. And Canada has announced it will go ahead with its $700 million deep Pinuke project off the coast of Nova Scotia. Paul Withers has more. Today's low-key announcement ends five years of waiting. Uh, obviously, everyone's excited down here. It's a great day for Encana, for uh, Halifax and uh, Nova Scotia. So we're very, very pleased. After delaying, then downsizing its original plan, and Canada's board today formally approved development of its Deep Pinuke gas field 175 kilometers off the coast of Nova Scotia. The plan, in 2010, began pumping two to 300 million cubic feet a day of natural gas to markets in Canada and New England. Uh, this project uh, passed all the thresholds that the company uh, required uh, to have. Deep Panook will be much smaller than Nova Scotia's other offshore development, Exxon's Sable project. The two companies were unable to agree on terms to share the existing pipeline, forcing Encana to build its own. We should get uh, maybe 200 people here with all sorts of different trades. The decision to proceed great news for dozens of Nova Scotia companies, small and large, like Laurentian Energy of Sydney, a fabrication yard looking for a piece of the $700 million in Canada will spend developing Deep Panook. The spin-offs for Cape Breton companies and uh, individuals who may not be working in Cape Breton right now is tremendous. In addition to the hundreds of jobs it will create, Deep Panook will generate $400 million in royalties. Nova Scotia's premier hopes it will also revive an offshore stalled by years of dry holes. A lot of opportunity and uh, you know it's going to generate again the interest in Nova Scotia's offshore. Deep Panook is a lot smaller than when it was first proposed five years ago. 
but it is a project, and that, more than anything else, is what Nova Scotia's offshore needs. Paul Withers, CBC News, Halifax. We mentioned that oil finished today above $90 a barrel for the first time. That's partly because of lower oil supplies in the United States and partly because of new U.S. sanctions against Iran. Here's the closing number. Britain's BP oil has been fined $373 million by the U.S. Department of Justice. It had been accused of fraud and violating environmental laws. That followed an explosion at a Texas refinery. Fifteen people were killed, 180 were injured. The fine is the highest ever levied by the U.S. government for environmental issues. North American stock markets headed in different directions today with stronger oil prices pushing up the Toronto exchange. The TSX main index ended up 36 points. Potash jumped more than 5% on record earnings. More on that later. Canadian Natural Resources also was stronger with a better than 3% gain. Research in Motion headed the other way, down 4%. The Dow was flat, losing just three points. American International dropped 3%, hurt by recent credit problems. General Motors also weak, down 2.5%. The Nasdaq lost 23, almost 24 points. Comcast plunged 11% on slowing subscription numbers. Soft drink company Cot reported a $5 million loss for its latest quarter. It blamed a slump in North America as well as the cost of restructuring. The Toronto company took $15 million in charges related to the restructuring, and sales in North America fell more than 7%. Cot CEO Brent Willis says he's disappointed with the results. And Motorola says third quarter profits dropped 94% compared to last year. The struggling tech company made $60 million. Sales were sharply lower. The company is in the midst of a turnaround and believes the worst is now behind it. It says there are some signs of improvement in its core cell phone business. Saskatchewan's Potash Corporation hit record profits, but it fell short of expectations. With more on that story and some earnings news, here are today's highlights. Potash said third quarter earnings soared 67 percent. The company said high grain prices have pushed up production increasing demand for its fertilizer products. Still, profits were not as high as analysts predicted. Maple Leaf Foods posted earnings of $220 million in its third quarter. Most of that came from a gain on the sale of its livestock feed division. Maple Leaf says profits would have been even higher if not for rising grain costs and the higher value of the Canadian dollar. Toronto-based Barrick Gold is expanding. The company has bought a gold mine and prospecting licenses for almost 3,000 square kilometers of land in Papua New Guinea. The deal is worth $141 million. The region has one of the world's highest concentrations of gold and copper. After the break on CBC News Business, our market watcher Julie Bro gives us a closer look at the day's trading and later in the program. Write downs, layoffs on Wall Street, foreclosures. Are these the ingredients leading to a U.S. recession? That's still to come. Don't forget, you can send Fred and the rest of the team an email. Write to us at businessnews at cbc.ca. Closed captioning is brought to you by TD Waterhouse, a wealth of experience. You trade for yourself. Now trade up to the TD Waterhouse Discount Brokerage Active Trader Platform. Ranked number one for active traders. Featuring point and click order entry with direct market access. Real time streaming market data and more. So you can invest with even greater confidence. All in one place. Download the active trader demo now. Open your account online and trade for as low as $7 flat per trade. four-wheel active steering system. Now cornering is more precise, handling more responsive. The all-new 330 horsepower Infiniti G Coupe. Intensity. Captured. With portable high-speed internet from Roger Yahoo, my office is wherever I am. 
desks, filing cabinets, they'd only slow me down. I plug into any power outlet, or in this case, a power adapter, and I've got high-speed internet on the go. I'm uploading a virtual tour of my new listing as we speak. Now your office is wherever you are with portable internet from Rogers Yahoo. Call or visit us today. Welcome to My Best Western. As a business owner, I know what business travelers need. Free high-speed internet access. Breakfast. And fresh and new coffee. And the promise, you'll find these things at every Best Western. At My Best Western, you're not just a guest. You're my guest. Best Western. Ownership shows. Through November 16th, stay two nights. Stay two nights. Use your MasterCard card. MasterCard card. Earn twice the rewards. Twice the rewards. Twice is nice. Very nice. Go to bestwestern.com. The award-winning Kia Rondo. Nicely equipped from 1995. The city people love to hate. Toronto's a buzzkill. I don't like the smell. Everyone in Toronto's really hairy. Watch one man try to put things right. I'm here for Toronto Appreciation Day. Let's all hate Toronto on the land. Sunday at 10 on CBC News World. A senior official of the Securities and Exchange Commission in the United States says insider trading appears to be rampant on Wall Street. Linda Thompson, the regulator's enforcement director, says the SEC has formed working groups to focus on the problem. In March, U.S. prosecutors charged 13 people with insider trading. Several were from top Wall Street firms, UBS, Morgan Stanley, and Bear Stearns. The dollar rose at one point, trading above 104 U.S. cents for the first time since 1974. It was helped by record oil prices. However, it did not close above 104. It fell in late afternoon trading and closed at 103.53 cents, still up more than a third of a cent on the day. Slipped uh, just one point against the euro, closing at 72 points. And joining us for her reaction to the Alberta royalty announcement and the rest of the day's market movers, Julie Bro, Vice President of Wealth Management for Morgan Meehan and Associates. So what is your reaction to Alberta's announcement? Well, I think that the market had started to believe that there'd be a fairly comfortable compromise made between the early suggestions from the committee and what was going to come with it. And from a very preliminary view, it looks like the oil companies are probably not going to be extremely pleased with what is coming out. Um, the royalties are going to be going up very significantly, particularly on the oil sands producers where the base royalty will go from 1% up towards 9% depending on energy prices and probably somewhat dependent on time too. Th those are big increases. How will it affect the energy stocks and the ones you invest in? Well, again, I think the oil sands companies are going to be the biggest hit off the top. With um, names? Name, that would Canadian, be the Canadian Suncor, oil sands Canadian oil sands, probably um, Canadian Natural Resources. They're just trying to get up to production. So this is a big change in the terms of what they expected when they started developing their horizon plan. And I think it's scheduled to come on next year. Uh, so that will be another one who certainly feels some effect. And oil, on the, the, this is all happened on the day when oil closed at $90. So uh, where do you see it heading from here? Well, I, th I think the story for in the short term on oil continues to be bullish. Um, there's a lot of momentum there, and part of the commodity price is always about momentum. Um, I think that it's a very rich price. I don't think we are running out of oil, or there's any great shortage of oil. There is shortage of refining capacity, but I think we are in an upward trend line. It will bounce around, but someday we're going to see $100 oil. Microsoft stock up uh, in after hours trading, according to the screen over here. Uh, what did you make of its numbers? Well, again, on a preliminary look, they, they seem very good. The revenue numbers were up, I think, 27%. Um, Halo was a big winner for them in the quarter. And Microsoft's a company you don't expect to see big surprises from. And I think the street was obviously very surprised by how much they were able to drive out of the quarter. And other technology stocks, Ericsson, uh, Myrol, and Palm are all having problems. Uh, are they falling behind their competition? 
Well, I think that's exactly what you're seeing happening. They're, they're, they're in very competitive sectors that are also quickly transitioning sectors. Um, if you look at Motorola, that it's all about the new handsets, that the new having the new cool thing. And if you miss, then you suffer accordingly. And Palm is, I think, clearly losing market share to Research in Motion, um, who has come to dominate that space. And if you have to rejuvenate yourself on a regular basis in that sector, and these are companies that just haven't been able to have that new thing. Uh, what, did, what was going on in Toronto today? It was just up a few points, but energy stocks were up, I noticed, even though they're ahead of the uh, announcement. Well, and I, I wouldn't be surprised to see a lot of that reverse tomorrow um, now that we have actual numbers, because I think there was some optimism there. But it, oil prices were high. Uh, financial markets were, the financial sectors in Canada and the U.S. were concerned again about big write-downs. Rumors were flying that AIG was going to have to write down part of their subprime market uh, holdings. And it's this tug of war going back and forth. In Canada, we have strong commodity prices, which is supportive, but there's this underlying concern that the U.S. economy is slowing down, and every time there's a new story, it's a drag. So we're getting these seesawing days. What about potash? Uh, it was up again, in spite of its numbers, which some people thought were disappointing. Well, I, I was quite comfortable with potash's numbers, and certainly with their outlook. And the stock was up quite comfortably at one point in time during the day, uh, about 5% in response to that. Um, they, they continue to tell a good story. That and Canada numbers, what about them? And Canada was also showing uh, good numbers. Uh, their oil sands production has been very strong, which has been a driver. They've been very cost conscious uh, on their capital budget that they're finding that they can, the costs are dropping there for the first time in many years, so they're getting more done with less money. And again, people were quite optimistic on that. Uh, before we go, do you or your firm own any of the stocks we've talked about here? We own many of the stocks that we have. And Canna, AIG, Suncor, CNQ, all the oil companies that we've talked about. Well, we'll see what happens tomorrow. Thanks very much. Thank you. After the break on CBC News Business, does talk of a recession spawn a recession? First, a look at some headlines from around the world. This business update is brought to you by TD Waterhouse, a wealth of experience. Monkey flap, Spunk. <laughs> Nuki did Viagra. Knock her touch. Viagra dingo monkey quank. Viagra mufti chuck wobble. Oh, these are I'm tough to hear. The capital of Canada is moving to Northern Rivers. To find out why, call or visit us online. Fashion File has a new look and a new attitude. And to celebrate, we're bringing the world of fashion home to you. Tune into Fashion File Monday nights at 7.30 on CBC. And watch for our weekly key words in our new Hot Stuff segment. Then visit FashionFile.com for instructions on how to win the featured item. Winners gift cards, exclusive clothing, accessories, and fragrances are all up for grabs. Hot Stuff, just for you. Presented by Winners. Where else? Through these grandmother's eyes, I see every year that separates us. But look how close we are. My big little girl. When you're happy, your nose crinkles and your eyes twinkle. Watching you makes me feel young again. I was five once, too, and when I look back, it doesn't seem so long ago. Iris, as unique as your eyes. Better hurry if we're going to make that chill. Yeah. <laughs> 
cleared? Maybe you guys should go on ahead without us. You sure? Yeah, we'll catch up. How did you know which wire to disconnect? Ask your doctor if Cialis is right for you. You trade for yourself. Now trade up to the TD Waterhouse Discount Brokerage Active Trader Platform. Rank number one for active traders. Featuring point and click order entry with direct market access. Real time streaming market data and more. So you can invest with even greater confidence. All in one place. Download the Active Trader demo now. Open your account online and trade for as low as $7 flat per trade. Mr. Brooks is a mindbender of a thriller. Hello. Spellbinding. Kevin Costner, Demi Moore, Dane Cook, William Hurt. I'm going to kill again. Mr. Brooks, own it today. Is it Mickey Viagra? Viagra, Flabberjump. Viagra, Basil Rocker, Flangerati. Flangerati? Mm. Nick Bibley, top Tufty. I'm Carla Robinson at CBC News World, Canada's news network. Here are some stories we'll have for you tonight on Around the World. Winning the battle in California, Neil MacDonald has the latest from the front lines. And echoes of pre-war Iraq, Henry Champ on Washington's latest confrontation with Iran. That's coming up on Around the World at the top of the hour. Now back to CBC News Business with Fred Langan. Thanks. Almost two-thirds of Americans say a recession is likely in the next year. That from a Bloomberg L.A. Times survey. The never-ending litany of falling house prices and mortgage foreclosures leaves many Americans pessimistic. And joining us from Washington on why the average person thinks a recession is coming, Peter Morisi, a business professor from the University of Maryland. So why are Americans so down? Well, we've been getting a lot of bad economic news, and there's been a lot of bad news in people's neighborhoods. Folks can't sell their homes because the mortgage market is not functioning. Housing prices have been falling. They read that gas prices are headed north thanks to higher oil prices. And columnists in the paper have been talking about the specter of recession. CEOs are cutting back their profit estimates for next uh, quarter and for, for next year. Overall, this seems to be the shadow of gloom coming over the U.S. population and the economy. So. Can popular fear of a recession actually make it happen? Absolutely. If everybody decides there's going to be a recession and everyone stops spending money, then we will have a recession. You know, for the last couple of quarters, the U.S. economy has continued to grow as the housing sector has contracted and could continue to do so because folks kept on spending, uh, as did businesses. But now everybody seems to be pulling in their horns. Uh, the Federal Reserve's soundings on the economy, the Beige Book, which, goes to the re which comes from the regional banks, their soundings of, of businesses throughout the country, seem to indicate that business activity is simply slowing down. Well, can't uh, the central bank just keep chopping interest rates and that props up the economy? Not as much as you think. For one thing, if it cuts interest rates, it doesn't have much of an effect on long mortgage rates. What's more, you can only really get a mortgage conveniently right now if it's for less than $419,000, you have perfect credit, and a long income track record, a long job record, so that you can get what's called a conforming loan uh, through one of the federally insured banks like Fannie Mae. Uh, if you have anything less than a perfect record, it gets very difficult right now. If you want a jumbo loan, you have to pay a huge premium. Uh, right now, the mortgage market is not functioning because bond buyers don't want to buy mortgage-backed securities because of the subprime debacle. Not all mortgages, not all mortgage-backed securities are backed by subprime mortgages or bad mortgages. However, okay. the market is just skittish. Now, a lot of professional economists, obviously not you, uh, but uh, people on Wall Street in particular, seem to take a "don't worry, be happy" attitude. Uh, everything is going to be all right. Uh, why is that? Well, I think that folks on Wall Street are very difficult to accept that they have created such a morass. One has to remember that the current plight of the U.S. economy has its roots uh, in really bad financial practices at places like uh, Citigroup, for example, which created a structured investment in this, uh, vehicle, which off the books does things banks should never do, and that is basically make risky loans and borrow short and lend long 
Uh, and so Wall Street's reluctant to admit its own, uh, its own blame in this. Uh, what would it take to tip the American economy into a recession right now? Uh, we may have had it this week. Uh, Merrill Lynch reported huge losses on its mortgage portfolio, 13% of its capital. It's much more likely that a, it's, a bigger, it's a bigger share than that. Uh, countrywide, the largest mortgage company in the country is reporting uh, in some of its prime mortgages are defaulting, uh, the so-called uh, adjustable rate mortgages to prime borrowers. Uh, if the housing market continues to tank, the way it did in September. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that will be enough. Uh, next, year is, next year is an election year in the United States. Uh, are the Republicans toast, or are they going to try and do everything to avoid a recession? Well, what can the Republicans reasonably do? Uh, they could try to cut taxes. The Congress won't let them. Uh, Pelosi and the Re Democrats aren't about to give the president anything he wants next year, because they're salivating at the joy of taking over the White House. If you look at the policy prescriptions of the leading candidate, it all comes down to a very vague promise of national health care, which Americans want. Uh, and uh, the Republicans have the difficulty of defending themselves uh, on top of an unpopular war. It's not a good time to be a Republican. Okay, well, that's uh, very interesting. Thanks very much for talking to us today. You're welcome. It's been a pleasure. In late breaking news, the Bank of America is getting out of the wholesale mortgage business. 700 jobs will be cut from its mortgage division. And spinning off Tim Hortons has taken a bite out of profits at Wendy's. The fast food company reported after the close of trading today that third quarter earnings fell 57% compared to a year ago. Wendy's shares are down 19% from the highs over the past year. The pictures from the fires in California are riveting. Helicopter shots of blazing houses, even pictures of the fire from space. But perhaps one of the most arresting images was a still that appeared in this morning's newspaper. It showed a crescent where a ring of suburban homes once stood. Almost all of them are just black ash. But there were three or four still standing. All of the houses left had tile roofs. Most of the houses that burned had cedar shingles or shakes which can't withstand a shower of hot sparks. Cedar shingles and new construction were banned in Los Angeles earlier this year. Now the building inspector for Santa Barbara says the shingles contribute to fires since many of them, uh, the cedar shingles that is, come from British Columbia. A change in zoning laws in California could hurt another vital part of BC's forest industry. And that's this edition of CBC News Business. I'm Fred Langan. I'll be back tomorrow at 6.30 Eastern. Hope to see you then. Uh, you can catch a replay of this program on the main CBC network at 3 a.m., 3.30 in Newfoundland. Bye for now.